All right. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Anna Kuriakos. I'm the program director at uh, the SCAN Foundation, and um, I've had the pleasure of leading this first group in our first ever pilot 2020 youth leadership program. Um, we have seven students with us. You may not see all of them. There are a couple technical things that we're still working around, but hopefully by the end of this, you will be um, able to hear from each of them. Um, I am sad that this is a virtual ending for our program. I wish we could have met, I wish you could have met them in person, and I wish we could have uh, done something a little bit more formal and um, you know, gathered, but uh, that is okay. I'm glad you're with us. I'll give you a brief introduction to what the program has done this year, and, um, and then I'll turn it over to the students. So as many of you know, we started this back in January. Since then, we've met uh, at least once a month using um, a curriculum that was originally designed back then to uh, provide leadership training skills and a little bit of background about the South Asian community and um, some self-discovery and self-exploration. We had to modify that as we went along because of um, pandemic related issues and concerns. And so we did the best we could and, and students were able to meet and um, discuss and eventually um, have come up with this, this final project. So today you'll get some insight into their contributions to the program. This was an independent leadership proposal that they had to um, write and present. The assignment was to choose an issue relevant to our community and propose a solution. So I'm happy to say that these proposals that they've come up with vary widely across fields and across um, problems. So if anyone watching this live or watching this recording feels like they would like to connect with a student regarding their idea, I would be happy to connect you after these presentations. For now, this was a thought project, so they had to anticipate some obstacles and, and work through what their solutions might be. So I'll give you a brief outline of, today, of how today will work. Um, each student will present for approximately 10 minutes. They will be sharing their own screens. Um, I will be keeping time and we'll stop them if they run over time just to respect everybody's um, time here. At the end of each topic, there will be a brief Q&A if you have any. Uh, keep in mind that if, there, if you'd like to connect with students later, I can do that as well. But if there's anything pressing, I will stop for a few seconds and, and see if, um, if you'd like to ask any questions. If so, you can unmute yourselves and, and ask. At the very end of the presentations, I will invite, um, if they are available and on screen, I'm going to invite um, Dr. Marotra, Dr. Murthy, and Dr. Guy to say a few words, um, just for a few minutes each. And we should be closing this meeting by 1130 at the latest. Uh, with that, I will stop and let the kids begin. Our first student is Shreya. And students, as you start, please introduce yourselves, say your full name, um, where you go to school and what your project is on. Um, okay, so can you hear me? Okay, uh, my name is Shreya Manchenda. I go to school at Edison High School and my project is on the reduction of plastic. Okay. So this is a chart, a graph on the mismanaged plastic by, con by countries, the global share of mismanaged plastic waste. And clearly this was a problem in East Asia and South Asia. Okay, so the Indian American population by state in America with having the most in California and then New York and New Jersey. This presentation is mostly focused on New York and New Jersey probably because it was about our community. And um, so for some background, South Asians are individuals with origins in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and the Maldives. Um, the New York City metropolitan area is home to the largest concentration of South Asians in the U.S., which includes Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. In New York, consumers will be able to recycle plastic carryout bags at certain retail stores and most grocery stores. It actually started March 1st, 2020. And New York also banned 
to stop pollution and protect, protect our environment, our water, land, and wildlife. And the New Jersey State Senate voted to ban single-use plastic bags as well as styrofoam and take out containers across the state on March 5th, 2020. However, Governor Phil Murphy vetoed a bill to ban single-use plastic bags. So my first solution to create change was by changing the laws. Many people believe that banning thin plastic bags would help us get rid of the waste. However, Governor Andrew Kimono of New York quickly learned that this wasn't very helpful because when you ban single use plastic bags, people tend to use thicker plastic bags or paper bags to carry out their grocery items. And so a solution to this would be to ban thin plastic bags, but also make sure that thick plastic bags and paper bags cost customers money, which will cause people to bring their own reusable bags from home and will help in saving the environment. Um, the second is at home methods. So something South Asians do pretty well is buying at bulk, especially in Costco. That's the um, consumer demographic for Costco and it's clearly mostly Asian. And um, Costco is the third largest grocer in US after Walmart and Kroger. And this helped produce plastic because the product to package ratio allows there to be more product and less packaging, which means less plastic. Recycling is also really important, which people can do at home. Helping raise awareness for recycling can be a step we take as a community. Definitely posting about it on social media to show the condition of the oceans will cause people to donate and take action. Um, the next solution I have is education and awareness. Education on world issues is always important to raise awareness. And we have some amazing activists such as Greta Thunberg who gained a large following on social media and has brought light to many environmental related problems. And another person working to protect the earth is Leonardo DiCaprio, whose foundation is now part of the Earth Alliance. The Earth Alliance is a new organization trying to help address the urgent threats to our planet's life support systems. And New Jersey students will start learning about climate change in kindergarten and keep the studying the crisis through graduation under the state's new education standards. Um, the fourth solution is volunteering. A simple way to remove plastic is to physically go remove it from the ground. So you can go to parks and beaches and pick up plastic and collect it to recycle it. Both of these options are not hard in New York and New Jersey, especially because there are plenty of parks and beaches. It's also a bonding experience for everyone that goes. So it's a pro pro and it's rewarding to see the actual difference that you can make. Um, another solution is change in the community. Recycling, so adding more recycling bins near trash cans will help people make sort out trash and plastic so it can be recycled to help the environment. Many people, well, many places only have trash cans, so recycle items aren't put in recycling bins and everything just goes to the trash. Um, bottled water, plastic bottled waters waste so much plastic, oil, and end up in the oceans, and they're awful for the environment. So using reusable bottles is an easy switch and much better for the environment. Plastic bottles are petroleum-based. In the U.S. alone, it takes 1.5 million barrels of oil to meet the demands. An estimate of 15,000 plastic bottles end up as waste in landfills or thrown in the ocean every second. And then another way to change at home would be to limit plastic utensils, cups, and plates. Although it's more convenient to throw away um, paper and plastic plates rather than doing the dishes, it's not good for the environment. Something as simple as buying a mug to make coffee instead of buying it from, let's say, Starbucks that use styrofoam or plastic cups would save plastic. And my last solution is putting pressure on the manufacturers. Although we can make a difference in our own habits, corporations have a much bigger footprint. So if a company could be smarter about its packaging, it would be easy to write a letter or send a tweet or hit them where it really hurts and give, their, give your money to a more sustainable competitor. Thanks, Drea. Does anyone have any questions? OK, 
Okay, if you do, please hold on to them and we will come back to them at the end. We'll keep moving for now. Anna, this is yes. Vasu. Yes, hi Vasu. Can I ask you, Shreya, uh, why you chose this topic? Um, I'm going to take environmental science next year and I wanted to do some research beforehand on whatever I can figure out about the environment and how to help save it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Vasu. All right, uh, we'll move on to our next student, uh, Hemant. Hemant, can you hear me? Can you turn on your video so everyone can see you? Yes. Do you, would you like to share your presentation or would you like me to? I can. Okay, go ahead. Let me know if you have trouble, I can share it from my end. You can share it from your end. Okay. I sent it to you, right? Yes, I have it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Send some water. Okay. When you want me to go to the next slide, just let me know next slide. Go ahead. Um, I, I think he said he was going to get some water. Oh, he was going to get some water, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have him come back. Oh, he's already back. Okay. Go ahead, Heyman. What? Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The novel coronavirus was first discovered in China and on January 31st, the Health and Human Services Secretary declared a public health emergency. Heyman, can you fix your audio to be a little bit louder? What? That's good. I'm good. Okay. I was Go talking ahead. to my dad, not to you. That's okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Keep going. Please. Most. People with COVID-19 have fever and dry cough. So some have mucus production and fatigue. Next. Wait, please. To prevent the spread of COVID-19, you can stay home if you're sick, wash your hands, 
Clean and disinfect. Avoid close contact and pay bills electronic. Next. These are the countries of South Asia. And next. COVID-19 has had a major impact on the U.S., including on South Asian immigrants. They're more vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic. Next. My initiative is sending COVID-19 related information to South Asian families. Information on symptoms of coronavirus and preventative measures will be included. The information will be translated into many South Asian languages, including Hindi, Bengali, and Marathi. Next. And I can distribute the free face mask to <laughs> the South Asian community, particularly to elderly people who are more vulnerable to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. These are my sources. That's it. Thank you, Heyman. Does anyone have any questions for Heyman? Okay. If you do later, feel free to share and I will get them to him. Um, our next student will be Shreya. So good morning, everybody. My name is Shreya Bhargav, and I'm a sophomore at Hillsborough High School. And the problem that I chose to research in our community was internalized racism. So with everything going on in the nation today, I thought it was really important to know where exactly we as a community stand. So it's important to realize that as South Asians, we are neither the oppressed or the oppressor. And at, we're bystanders because as non-Black people of color, we're neither the oppressed or the oppressor. So we have to sit here and ask ourselves, what if this was happening to our community? What would we do and how would we react? So it's important to realize that the civil rights movement of the 1960s benefited the Asian American community extremely. So while the civil rights laws were being passed, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 was also passed. And this is also known as the Hart Seller Act. It opened immigration for all Asian community, Asian countries and helped dismantle heavily restricted immigration policies. The fight for black rights has and will always help achieve equality for all people of color, including the South Asian community. So many people use the idea that we are the model minority as a reason why we shouldn't be affected by the racism that occurs in the country and we shouldn't be affected by the Black Lives Matter movement. This is a myth. So the myth describes us as Asian, Asian Americans as a polite, law-abiding group who have achieved a higher level of success than the general population through some combination of innate talent and pull yourselves up by your bootstraps in the great striving. So while looking at this theory slash myth, I found three major flaws. The first one being that it erases the differences among individuals. 
The myth hides the pressures and paradoxes that are very deep rooted within the Asian American community. Their sizable presence at elite universities and high household incomes have helped construct the narrative of Asian American exceptionalism. We have, to, we have to realize that when the original group of Asian American immigrants came to America, including in specifically the South Asian subcontinent, only the very educated class was allowed to come here. So when we came to America, we already started out at such a high level. So that's where this idea that we're all like very smart and the house, high household incomes comes into play. But for the past, since 1965, since immigration has opened, this has changed. There are, there are South Asians in almost every single economic class and we fail to recognize that not everybody in our own community has the same opportunities. So the second flaw that I found was that the myth also ignores the diversity of Asian American cultures, specifically the South Asian um, community. So we often forget how many different groups actually make up this uh, community and the experiences are not the same for each man. So one example that I found was that a white man, for every dollar a white man makes, an Indian man can make 15 cents more, a dollar 15. But for that same dollar, a Nepali man will make 65 cents. So it's clear that even in, even in our own community, equality isn't there. And the third flaw that I found was that this myth is harmful to the fight for racial injustice. So this myth, this myth places people of color against one another. So for lack of better terms, it creates a hierarchy in which Asian people are often shown as the top or the most elite group. This just distracts us from working together towards equality for all people of color and instead pits us against one another in competition. So this doesn't have a direct, direct solution. So I came up with, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened. We can still see your screen. Oh, you can still see it. Okay, one second. It's just, okay, yeah. So, um, so uh, we have to remove the anti-blackness within our own community, which is very deep rooted and it can be hard to do. So it can be really hard to start a conversation with people in our community about anti-black racism, white supremacy and solidarity within people of color and how it affects us. It's important to realize that without the hard work that African-Americans put into overturning racist laws, we as a community would not be here today living as we are today. So why is this so important to us and how does it affect us and what could we do? So as we all know, we all watch the news, the Black Lives Matter movement is becoming more and more spoken about and more aggressive and awareness is on the rise. So we as South Asians living here have to some extent, not all of us, but to some extent have a certain kind of privilege. It's up to us to use our voice and privilege to speak up and use our voice to make a change so people of color must stick together as we have fought this fight for racial justice together since the very beginning. So I came up with six steps that we as a community could do. And again, there's no direct solution because this is so internalized at this point that we have to, we have to take it slowly. So the first step that I came up was start the conversation within our own homes. So by simply starting this conversation with our parents, with our siblings, with our friends, it's a stepping stone in the right direction because it raises awareness and brings up the issue that people might not even know about. And this in itself can be a difficult task. The second step would be educating ourselves on the Black Lives Matter movement. So it's important to understand that this movement is not just because George Floyd was murdered. George Floyd was murdered in an unjust way, but he was a criminal, but that does not mean that he was to be killed like that. This movement and these protests are because of the years and decades of oppression that they've had to suffer. And you can consider this like the tipping point. The third and most important, in my opinion, is understanding how to undo our anti-blackness. This obviously cannot be done overnight because it's so internalized into our community. So we have to start by explaining to others how white supremacy and racism affects all people of color, including the South Asian community. We have to acknowledge that the liberation for the black community can and will lead to the equality for all people of color. When we ourselves say anti-black things, appropriate black culture, seek the white man's validation, we're just reinforcing systems that oppress our own people even if we don't experience it firsthand. The fourth step that I have is signing petitions. So reposting social media, texting your friends and sending in your WhatsApp groups, yes, it helps by raising awareness, but it doesn't take immediate action. There are numerous petitions that you can sign or numbers that you can text to demand justice for those who have lost their lives. Number five, it's really simple, just vote. The South Asian community often has the lowest voter turnout in the nation, but then we're the same people who are upset when our elected officials don't have our best interests at heart and don't look out for us. We don't have the right to if we don't vote. 
So encouraging voting can just help us slowly win this battle. And the final step would be emailing your elected officials. So emailing your local representative is one of the most effective ways that you can help make a change. And there are hundreds of, publics, hundreds of public numbers, emails, and addresses of local and state officials where you can demand for a change and ask exactly what their specific plan is to tackle this issue. So obviously I, I can't do this alone. I can't just stand here in front of a room of adults because no one A, would take me seriously, no one would listen to me, and B, it just won't be as effective. So if I was to work with a bigger organization such as SKN, it, I could work to help create a, like a website specifically dedicated to the movement, which could help reach out to all people of all ages, all people, and a bigger audience in general. So this website could have a list of resources to help the movement specifically, educational materials explaining the civil rights movement, explaining how it affects our community, and educational materials about the Black Lives Matter movement and why this movement is getting so aggressive right at this moment. If I was to work with a bigger organization also, it would help arrange meetings with local government officials and state elected officials where community members can come and voice their opinions and be heard. So it's time to make a change and it starts with us and we have to realize our own wrongs to make a change. Thank you. And these are my sources. Thank you, Shreya. Um, as I'm sure the audience can tell, all of our students chose very timely topics, um, which I, I certainly appreciate. Does anyone have any questions for Shreya? If so, you can unmute yourselves and ask. We'll wait a few seconds and then move on. Okay, Shreya, this is Vasu. Um, you, I think, uh, first of all, very nicely done. Um, you did a lot of research and more important than the research, I think the thought that went into it was really nice. Um, your thought process behind that. You focused specifically on race. I just want to ask you, do you see inequality in any other form or shape? in addition to race? Well, I think there is inequality, obviously, because we are a minority at the end of the day. But I mean, I just focused on like internalized racism and how out of all the minorities, we like face probably the least discrimination. But I think there are other forms of discrimination that we face every day, like even in school, like it happens. Okay, and um, are you choosing to focus only on race or would you be interested in focusing on other uh, aspects of inequality, like gender, culture, ability. Oh yes, definitely. This is just my project. Yeah, I'm, yeah. All right. Thanks, Shreya. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Basu. We're gonna move on to our uh, next student, Abhinav. Are you able to share now? Anna. Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. As you can tell, this is quite a coordinated effort from several people in several locations. Abhinav, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to share my content. Okay. Good. Awesome. Abhinav, you're on mute. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, my perspective is. Hang on one second, we're getting feedback from somewhere.
Can you try again? Still on mute. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, my project is meant. Yeah, there's a lot of feedback. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, my project is mental health awareness and assistance through values of Hinduism. Uh, So, um, hello, my name is Abhinav. I'm a sophomore in Montgomery High School. Um, I'm extremely thankful for presenting this presentation for you all. Uh, mental health awareness and assistance to values in Hinduism is my topic for today, and it's very relevant during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I got interested in the ideas of mental health through a health class I took in freshman year where they discussed the importance of mental health, especially in teenagers, but it's a topic relevant to people throughout the world, and specifically in the South Asian community because of the stigma and shame associated with having problems with mental health. So firstly, what is mental health? Mental health refers to the maintenance of a successful mental activity. It includes maintaining productive daily activities and maintaining good relationships with others. It also includes the ability to cope with stress and how it affects you. So this can be caused by a lot of stress from work, uh, relationship problems at home. So staying on top of things like this and having the ability to talk and open up to others would be able is a good way to stay in a good mental health. So who are South Asians? South Asians are specifically people who make up seven countries. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and the Maldives. These peoples are diverse, multifaceted, and successful, and a successful community in the United States. As you can see by the illustrations, it shows that these people are very multicultural. Uh, they're wearing different attires, have different types of cuisine, different languages. So even though they're from the same region, they're com they might be completely different people. But one of the things that make them all similar is that they all have you know, the normal stress that everyone have, has in the world that, that related to mental health. Next, the barriers faced with mental health. As stated before, there's a lot of stigma and shame associated with mental health, especially in the South Asian community. Keep going is the message echoed out to over and over. Tough it out is just engraved into the heads of many South Asian individuals when it comes to mental health. It is something you're used to hearing in South Asian culture, where having a high pain threshold is something to brag about, where only a certain type, type of pain is permissible. People always want to paint a picture of resilience and great work culture and hide the mental health because of the social stigma. In spite of there being a large number of mental health issues in India and several other South Asian countries, Mainstream society does not accept them. This mentality is reflected here too in America. A lot of importance is given for physical well-being and mental health taken for granted. As I was researching, I found so many cases of suicide that it was very disturbing and shocking. Many of South Asians are not aware of the mental health practitioners and resources available at their disposal, and they deal with their pain in silence. Medical facilities have many um, programs to help people with mental health disorders. So this could benefit South Asian individuals greatly. So next, just correlating Hinduism with mental health to make it easier to relate to the South Asian community. It has been reported that it can cause change personality, reduce tension and, and diminish anxiety. Practicing Hinduism and, and doing things such as yoga and Ayurvedic Dietary practice can help greatly with things such as anxiety and personality disorders. Mental health disorders can cause depression and disorder, but, fat, but Ayurvedic dietary practices can help greatly with this. Fasting is an integral part of Hinduism and is seen as a means of purifying the body and soul, encouraging self-discipline and gaining emotional balance. They can also have good health benefits.
Yoga and meditation are some of the best solutions adapted from Hinduism. Combining psychiatry and Ayurveda treatment for, the, for a more holistic ap approach. Spirituality and religion can provide a source of strength and guidance that parallel with values of the recovery paradigm. Address the so issues through ed education and awareness to eliminate social stigma and shame. During my research, I watched an interesting video on Amazon Prime documentary called Healing Mind, Ayurveda and Western Psychiatry. This spoke in length as in combining Ayurveda with modern medicine to take a more holistic approach. Or organizing small camps and workshops for mental health awareness is a way to combat this issue. Creating support groups in South, a South Asian languages is also another way. Making a forum that, that lists out medical practitioners with specific zip codes is a way to allow the, not only South Asians, but people as a whole to realize that they have medical practitioners at their disposal. Providing teenagers with, with training as well as adults to act like some, somewhat as a big brother or big sister or anyone like a role model who they have someone to talk to can also help alleviate stress and depression amongst people. A toll-free hotline such as the suicide hotline, but also for, for great depression would also help. Uh, one second. Uh, lastly, any questions? And I have some questions. Thanks, Abhinav. Does anyone have any questions for him? Okay. Let's move on to our next student. Um, Milind, you're going to be next. All right. Oh, okay. Okay, so I will be talking about the language barrier in South Asian communities and the problem it poses. Uh, all right. So uh, why is it such a problem? Uh, essentially, the background of this is that, you know, uh, an inability to speak English happens for multiple reasons. It could be due to uh, old age, as in like coming to America with your family and not necessarily having a job. So maybe it's not you don't feel it absolutely necessary to learn the language. And maybe you come as a like a support for a spouse. So there are uh, so like most people come to America for job opportunities, but some people don't, and some people come to support their spouses, and maybe they're on a family life. And then again, it's a similar situation where it's not absolutely in in the moment you don't feel it's absolutely necessary to learn English as a language. So this causes multiple problems. It um, well the, the main issue is that you there's an inability to communicate with important resources like healthcare providers, court systems, and banks, which are crucial to, you know, a healthy life here. So that's, that's one of the main things. And then the importance of this is that the language barrier, it disrupts services for South Asian community, for the South Asian community. So um, for example, in the case of a, in the event of a court case or something, and someone that doesn't exactly have a full grasp on the English language, um, it, so self-advocacy becomes impossible because how, how would you explain your situation if you're unable to speak in the main medium of communication that most of America participates in? So that's, um, and that, res that can result in, like this is a, a not, this doesn't necessarily happen every single time, but it can result in exploitation of people that aren't necessary, that don't have a grasp on English. And just as like scammers prey on the elderly population of America, uh, it, uh, this then becomes a possibility that people who don't have a full grasp on English, they can be exploited and um, 
bad things can happen to them. So the importance and background overall is that it, it may seem that not learning English may seem not such a big, big deal, but it, it's a very crucial part of society and not learning it has some detrimental effects on your experience here. So uh, the main goal of this presentation is to talk about spreading awareness, highlighting existing services and encouraging push for legislation. So essentially, just as I've given the background and information about this, the overall goal in the community, like the ideal situation would be that you spread awareness throughout both the South Asian community and the whole commun the community as a whole. So explaining why this is a problem and it affects people of all backgrounds, not just South Asians, because people come from all parts of the world to come to America and um, similar situations apply where they may not all know English. So this, apply, this is a pretty universal issue. And while there are existing services, there, there's obviously, there's always room for improvement. So we wanna highlight those and talk about that. And then the final step is to encourage push for legislation because as much as the public wants, the only way to ensure lasting change um, in this issue is that laws are set up inherently to provide more for the people that are in these situations. So spreading awareness and highlighting existing services, it, um, you, the community has to know why it doesn't matter. Uh, this begins with explaining these issues to the South Asian community. Why does this issue matter? Why, why should you care about this issue? So this can be brought up in collective spaces in South Asian community events. And from there, this is where the core of the issue will begin. Uh, this is where the core of the advocacy for people that cannot advocate for themselves, that's where this will begin. So you begin there and you point in, in this, this process, you point out services such as English as a second language as is shown in the diagram there and other translation services. Uh, but, and then at the same time, you encourage donation f to these services to help them increase their funding to have a better overall impact. Because if you look at it, an overall, uh, it's a pretty small amount of money uh, in the pie chart that's being given to English as a second language uh, for these programs uh, in comparison with other adult education services. So awareness, with awareness comes a push for increased funding. And it begins with donation from your end but the eventual step, as I said earlier, is to push for legislation, which is, um, which is really the main point here. So like I said earlier, it's the only way to ensure lasting change. So the first step, um, they'll, yeah, it's the only way to ensure lasting change when the gov uh, because the government has to acknowledge the fact that there is a problem and then it, will pr uh, it agrees to provide more funding for these pro programs. And, then inherently every year they will be receiving more amount of money and they'll be able to enact more and better change each and every year. So uh, alongside advocating at community events or, or like after the step of the community events, a group is formed in which you try to uh, go into the overall community. And then it is, um, the, so this, this, eventually, this eventually leads to getting in touch with local lawmakers. But the first step is to find out what is being done currently. Like, as, as, as I said earlier, these programs are already set up. Uh, so what is the government, what is local government doing? How much money are they providing? Um, then the main thing, the, this is one of the most important steps is to get in touch with the leadership of these language services and translation services. This gives you a much more realistic view of what is being done, where the money is going and how it's being used. And this is where the pitch, essentially your pitch begins that you say, this is the issue we feel our community is facing. We wanna help, we wanna increase funding through donation and a push for legislation. And then after all both of these, you review the local budget and essentially like how much room there is, what can be done uh, on the part of the government to add to this, to create more or to put more money into this, or if necessary, where does money have to get, like, where does money have to get out from to be put into this? This is where advocacy really comes into play here alongside uh, uh, the language services because you have to, because um, the final step is taking this to the com overall community and the local government. And that involves setting up petitions and getting in touch with local lawmakers. So essentially, the, just as you've explained to the community and the language services why you feel this is a problem, uh, you, or you've explained this to your local community, you now need to, uh, it needs to expand throughout. Um, 
the rest of your town. So you have to explain why this is an issue and um, if necessary, why is it necessary to take money from some places and divert it to here and what, what problems this would cause and like the unjustness of the situation as mentioned before. It's a lack of advocacy for your people. So it's a pretty core idea that's just being um, infringed upon for a large population of immigrants. So that, um, so these petitions, what they will do is they'll, um, they'll increase the support for the funding in the community. Um, it'll, it'll spread word about the issue because uh, um, it'll spread word about the issue. It'll talk about who's backing the plan. And overall, this, um, this is actually a very important point, who's backing the plan. It increases the credibility of your argument. If it's just a bunch of community members saying, yes, this is a problem, we need to combat this. Yeah, sure, but who is backing that? What is stopping me from thinking, oh, this is just someone taking my money or this is just kind of a thing. Uh, the fact that they're in coordination with these uh, leader, the leadership of these language services shows that they have backing and credibility. And this is like an actual plan that is prob uh, that is going to go to the next level of government. Uh, and then, so obviously, in all plans are on the road to lasting legislation. It is it is it isn't an easy road, and there are um, plans don't always work out as originally thought or wanted to. So some poti uh, potential issues include issues with the language services and their leadership, a lack of room within budgets of these people, a uh, lack of community support. And so the first and last issue, um, they can be dealt with in a similar fashion. So a lack of, or issues with uh, language services um, is, could be something like the people that are working there currently feel that there are no major issues or they are doing enough or they, there's not more that can be done. So that, that's where advocacy comes again. You have to once again point out the issue of, yes, this is an issue. Yes, this is what people are facing. Bring out examples. There's always more that can be done to help the community because at the end of the day, that's what their job is. If, they're, if they don't feel like they're, um, if they feel like doing, if they feel like they're doing enough, it has to be known that in the off, sometimes they're just not doing enough. And then in the case of the community, once again, you have to point out that this is an actual issue. It's a universal issue. It doesn't just affect South Asians. It affects people of all backgrounds that don't speak English. And so uh, therefore it, the change for the better would change, the change in this would affect the entire community and help all people. And then the middle issue, the lack of room in the budget, this is, um, this would be a little detrimental to the cause, but this is a difficult situation in which the main course of action then becomes donation-based, uh, setting up fundraisers to provide money for the language services. So this is in the case that the town is, at, is uh, filled, uh, their budget is um, already filled. So they cannot endeavor any more money to any other causes or they're, um, they're unable to move any money. So in this case, um, you essentially have to take matters into your own hands and shift money where required and it's a lot of um, individual movement. So like, like I said earlier, donations, this is what the core of it's going to be, setting up fundraisers and things. So, yeah. All right. Um, any questions? Thanks, Milan. I have a question. Um, you mentioned several times rightly that there's a, that there are um, often obstacles in quote unquote finding money. Um, figuring out where to take money from and where to push money to. So if this was an effort that you would undertake to suggest that, uh, you know, language services be a priority, where could you potentially see, um, where, where would money be saved if that happened? Like where would be a, a potential place that would no longer need as much because this service is being um, provided? Okay, so um, in today's uh, current context, there's a thing going around calling defund the police. And so while, um, so that's, that's like an example, I'm not saying that's absolutely necessary to do. I'm just saying that maybe if people feel that uh, the budget of one organization, such as the police department, is too large, or they're getting too many resources, the money and resources that are being there, that are being put into there, can be diverted into place, in, like, essentially where excess is, you have to analyze where excess is, and uh, see where it can be spread out, because Again, advocacy is the core of this. You have to advocate for yourself because at the end of the day, if you don't do this, the community will not say, okay, this will, say, will not say this is an issue and this is where money, this, where money has to go. Thanks. Does anyone else have questions for Milan? All right, thank you, Milan. 
Um, next, we have Alyssa. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Uh, the topic of advocacy I focused on is civic engagement, specifically encouraging voter voting voter registration. So essentially, with the population of over 4.3 million, South Asians are one of the most rapidly increasing populations in the U.S. But of this population, approximately only 1.3 million, about 30 percent are citizens and eligible to vote. However, many South Asian, uh, South Asian voters encounter roadblocks on the path to the election booth, including voter intimidation and harassment, in, in, in addition to insufficient bilingual materials and lack of interpreters at the polls. As seen in this graph on the right, in, in the 2014 midterm, turnout amongst Asians was 20, 27%, the smallest compared to the other racial groups. Between the 2010 and 2014 midterm, Asian turnout dropped by 12%. Voting is, extreme, is extremely crucial because it helps choose the person or group of people who represent America as a nation and decide on regulations to govern the country. However, Asian voters turnouts are significantly minimal compared to those of white voters. Many South Asian voters don't vote or don't register to vote for many reasons. Some are unable to physically go and vote on election day because they may be working. Others, especially immigrants, often do not have the opportunity to gain knowledge on registration or voting sites and thus are not able to vote. Another main issue is that registration materials and voting ballots are not always translated into enough South Asian, South Asian languages for those who are not fluent in English. Since voting turnouts are not reaching its full potential in the South Asian community, it is essential to promote and encourage voter registration. The infographic on the left depicts data of the percentage of certain groups, and the one on the right depicts data of voters in certain states. It compares those who registered to those who did vote in the 2016 presidential election. The percentages are closely linked, which suggests that when more people register, there is a greater chance that there will be a greater voter turnout, as registration is essentially a commitment. Thus, to ensure increased voter turnouts from the South Asian community, community and population in political elections, especially for the upcoming 2020 pre presidential election, it is important to encourage voter, regi voter, sorry, voter registration. Oops, what happened? Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's important to encourage voter registration. My proposal for a community-wide advocacy project is an effort to register more prospective voters for the upcoming elections by providing them with the basic resources, the registration form, and knowledge. Personally, I have something that I could start with right away, and I would involve my UAC, UAC team, which is a club at my high school called the Understanding Asian Cultures Club. Um, we, although we kicked off just a few months ago and our activities have been hindered due to the pandemic and remote learning, there are over 70 members in the club and they are all able to contribute towards the cause. Of course, health safety measures such as wearing protective uh, masks and gloves and practicing social distancing would come into play. This would be executed by stationing several people at South Asian supermarkets in the community where several with several copies of registration forms. There, not only would we edu educate ex exiting shoppers about the necessity of practicing the right to vote and participating in the elections, but we would also educate them and provide them with the resources in order to register to vote. Exact locations, like exact supermarkets, would be decided upon further research on communities that are experiencing difficulty registering to vote or remarkably low vote, voter turnouts. An advantage to this, um, an advantage this would provide is that I and other club members would be able to explain in languages other than English to ensure that the South Asian shoppers would be able to understand. Uh, the translations would help because in areas like Union County, the voter registration form is available in only English and Spanish, neither of which are languages that are most commonly spoken by South Asian um, countries and communities. Language barriers prevent individuals from fully participating in the democratic process, keeping them from understanding electoral information in candidate platforms during the campaign cycle. So there, there are some potential next steps for bigger community-wide efforts. Greater goals including, include expanding to not only supermarkets, but also places such as beauty salons and recreational areas, most commonly used by <clears throat> South Asians, 
which would help read a wider audience. In addition, gathering and convincing South Asians to sign a petition requesting legislation and, gov um, and governors and towns to issue voting ballots in more South Asian languages, such as Hindi, which would be ex <clears throat> extremely instrumental in helping make the voting process simpler and more understandable. And like Millen had uh, mentioned before in his uh, presentation, contacting uh, legislations and asking for change and gaining support through petitions is a very instrumental way in bringing about change. A very significant course of action would also be potentially integrating voting into the school, in the school, into the school curriculum. The state of Kansas implemented the Kids Voting USA Civics Education Model, and not only did teaching children how to make how to vote make them more likely to follow through when they reached 18, but it also affected their parents. Voter participation was over 2% higher amongst 18 year olds who went through the program, as well as among their parents. There are also potential setbacks to consider. Uh, especially during this time during a pandemic, it may be more difficult to actively engage in conversations with shoppers due to social distancing and health safety issues than it would have been, let's say, prior to March. Uh, some other setbacks are that there may not be enough people or skills to account for all South Asian languages to communicate with every single shopper that we um, meet. And regarding actual voting, registration may, may prove to be futile if some states continue to actively remove individuals from voter rolls due to clerical errors reliance on, on inaccurate data, or if they suspect the individual voted in another state or has not voted recently. This is known as voter purging. This voter suppression tactic is disenfranchised, has disenfranchised thousands of American, Asian American people. In the 2016 election, presidential election alone, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund received over 250 complaints from Asian Americans about voting problems, including names missing from voter rolls. Also in the 2016 election, the state of Georgia rejected thousands of voter registrations from Asian American applicants because their names did not match up with slightly different spellings on other identification forms, which is a common problem amongst transliterated names. This was discovered by the Asian, Amer the Asian Americans Advancing Justice's Atlanta chapter, which launched a major initiative to register new Asian American voters. Uh, the state of Georgia rejected thousands of registrations because their name their, the applicant's westernized names contain middle names or hyphens that were slightly different from other identifications. And these spellings were the side effects of the various romanization systems used to translate Asian names. This is another barrier that suppresses voters as Asian Americans were six times more likely than whites to have their voter registrations turned away or delayed because of this. Not to mention workday timings are a major obstacle for voters as work hours can overlap with times when, vo when voting ballots are open. Thus, a great portion of potential voters are unable to vote. To conclude, it, it is extremely significant to encourage civic participation, um, specifically voting in South Asian communities. Regarding language barriers, Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act requires certain jurisdictions to provide such, assistant, su such assistance, like at polling places. However, just 27 jurisdictions in the US are covered for at least one Asian language. And even in covered jurisdictions, language assistance is not always fully available. In one 2012 study, 45% of a sample of covered precincts had missing or poorly displayed translated materials, and 23% lacked at least one Asian language by a lingual poll worker. However, in order to increase voting turnouts, there must be greater efforts made to increase registration. These efforts can be executed even at basic community levels, and I sincerely hope that ultimately the South Asian community will be able to utilize all the resources to vote and leave an impact on America. Thank you, and this is my sources. Thank you, Alyssa. Does anyone have questions for Alyssa? Okay, in that case, we will move on. Um, last but not least, we have Shivam. Thank you. Uh, one second. Can you all see what I'm presenting? Yep. All right, cool. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I am the last presentation, so I hope not to bore you. Uh, you guys have been sitting through a lot of presentations. They've all been great and they've all given a lot of information and I hope to do the same. 
So yeah, once again, hi, my name is Shivam Seal. I am a sophomore at the Middlesex County Academy for Science, Math and Engineering Technologies. And around, uh, I would say five weeks ago, just at our last uh, youth leadership program meeting, I thought of an, init uh, an initiative uh, called STEM Ninjas, which is a response to COVID-19. So what is the problem that uh, I'm trying to solve? So recently, uh, during around, I would say late April, uh, my sister actually came up to me, I, I think it was a science problem, which she was asking, uh, how do I do this? And I, I obviously explained it to her. And then I asked her what the school curriculum was like. What, what are they doing right now because of the outbreak? Because a lot of schools had to drastically change the curriculums. And she mentioned that they're actually not learning much. And I was kind of confused. Uh, the, the schools have been giving a lot of assignments. However, they haven't been advancing the knowledge of students, rather testing previous knowledge that they already have. So this led me to you know, research a bit more in my community, reach out to more people. And I learned from uh, my parents and some of my friends that this is the same ha thing that's happening around, you know, not only Edison, which is where I live, however, across the state and even other states. So uh, coming off of that, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, has, um, has changed the education system in the US and a lot of people aren't able to receive a proper education, especially in hard STEM subjects. So this is not only an issue in my community, nor just an issue in the town or the state, it's a nationwide issue. We must make STEM more accessible uh, to students uh, during this outbreak. And as you can see on the right, there are many reports uh, showing that students currently are not getting the education uh, that they would have been getting you know, previously and the education gap has increased. So why am I choosing STEM? So in the South Asian community alone, there are many motivated students who wanna pursue you know, topics like robotics, computer science or programming, mathematics, the different sciences like chem, bio, and physics. Uh, and, and STEM is the field of the future. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, STEM jobs uh, were to grow by 9 million between 2012 to 2022. However, according to the National Math and Science Initiative, as of right now, the US would need 1 million more STEM professionals to keep at the current rate, proving that we need more involvement and proficiency in the STEM field. Because of the motivation of South, uh, South Asians, uh, uh, we can see, we can, uh, you know, um, increase their involvement by providing another platform so that they can advance their STEM knowledge. Because as of right now, STEM is not a field that's being highly focused on during, you know, uh, during online schooling. It's the most basic of, of education. As we can see on the right, there aren't as many STEM graduates as there are jobs for this field. So we, we definitely need to increase uh, proficiency. A bit of the history of this, uh, of this issue. In 2011, President Barack Obama said, uh, this is our generation Sputnik moment, uh, calling for an increase in uh, STEM education. Uh, more, most recently, uh, the United States PISA rankings placed U.S. 38th out of 71 countries in math and 24th in science. When we think of the United States, we think of a developed nation with a lot of students pursuing high levels of, uh, uh, of education in colleges and, and beyond. However, we clearly need to increase the proficiency in STEM subjects uh, as we're ranked so low amongst all the different uh, uh, nations on the international stage. So according to um, Emeritus Professor Duger in a study in 2014, uh, many, students, many citizens in the US actually don't believe uh, that technology and engineering is, is relevant for our youth today, proving that we need some sort of a mindset change for a lot of, uh, a lot of Americans. So what is the initiative? First, going on to the mission. Uh, the mission is to provide a forward-thinking virtual platform aiming to instill inspiration, spread awareness, and increase proficiency in STEM amongst youth to enable them for a brighter future. So exactly what are we aiming for? We're, we're, trying to, we're striving to give back to the community in a time of need. Uh, our volunteers or STEM gurus at STEM Ninjas will be providing free virtual tutoring sessions in STEM field for kids in grades K through 12. And what are the main goals? Uh, to spread STEM knowledge, to make STEM more accessible to a larger group of people, motivate students to participate in the field and provide a platform for students to advance learning while at home and while curriculums aren't as advanced for the distance learning. 
So what is a solution in one action statement? STEM Ninja is a student-led nonprofit organization in response to COVID-19, providing virtual tutoring sessions in the STEM field for students in K through 12. So how exactly are we gonna execute this? Moving on to some, some executive positions that we, that we might need, uh, starting off with founder and chief visionary, which, which uh, would be my position. I would provide more of a vision direction for future projects and uh, managing other positions. Speaking of other positions, executive directors, which would oversee the managing of classes for, for volunteers. Uh, they would also be re responsible for responding to emails from parents or any questions and um, registration requests. So marketing directors uh, would mainly just utilize social media and other platforms to promote and contacts to promote uh, STEM ninjas and contact school districts, parents, or, or any other people that might be interested. So a volunteer, volunteer outreach director would be someone who, um, you know, they reach out to the different volunteers um, and, and ask people if they want to volunteer and they also help executive directors in managing um, all the others. So, uh, uh, regular updates uh, to the website would be done by a webmaster when necessary. If let's say we add another program or, you know, there's, uh, we add a donate link and then that would be updated by them. So department heads. So basically all this means is that for our different subjects, there'd be, you know, a, a main person that develops the curriculum and handles the, the questions from those specific tutors. Uh, going off of that, the subjects that, that would be taught, uh, math, uh, that, that are being taught, math, uh, science, computer science, engineering, and humanities. For engineering, as you can see, uh, I put K eight through 12 because uh, at the moment, engineering is pretty advanced subject in terms of mechanical or electrical engineering, which is why we want that to, for uh, kids who are going into high school or already are in. And possibly adding humanities as it's not only STEM that is definitely being affected due to the distance learning, but also humanities and you know, reading, writing, and, uh, and also even history. So humanities are, is also a big field that, that is being impacted. So it could be a possibility to you know, change the acronym from STEM to STEM. So communication amongst uh, people and also uh, outreach to others. So Facebook Messenger would be, you know, a medium to ask for questions to the whole team or casual communication. Uh, Slack would be used for more, more of a professional work environment and, uh, you know, release announcements about major things that are happening and also private group, groups for each department. Alongside Google Meet and Zoom, which would be used to both conduct classes and have volunteer and director meetings. We'd also use other mediums like in just Facebook overall and WhatsApp to contact parents and also emailing uh, school districts or school School admi uh, administrators like principals, superintendents, etc., to uh, to promote the program. So now on to something that uh, I call the pre-session. So so what is this? Uh, the pre-session is basically an initial would be an initial meeting uh, between the parent, student, and the tutor. They discuss questions uh, that the student might have uh, about the program and the curriculum for that subject. A very high level talk. Uh, a tutor would also need to figure out uh, how, um, what, what specific topics does a student need to focus on because each student has a specific need. Uh, they would also figure out day time for classes and they would use an, uh, a website which you guys might be familiar with uh, called Calendly to set up timings for an approximately 30 minute meeting. So as you can see on the right, this is just an example of a Calendly page with an already um, pre-posted pre-session tab if we if you click that and you actually go further you can you can look at the different times that a tutor is available to conduct that pre-session class so now moving on to the actual classes so in terms of how big the classes would be uh, tutors can conduct either group or one-on-one -on -one classes the maximum amount of students per tutor would be four because we don't want to overburden the tutor and we also don't want to don't want to lose the students in a larger class. We're trying to make the classes as small as possible. So the, the, the things that they'd be teaching would be based off of, uh, once again, a high level curriculum. Uh, it would just be certain resources and links that a tutor can use. And at that point, the tutor become, can become autonomous and teach maybe a little bit more of what, of what they want because the whole idea of STEM Ninjas is to make it personalized for a student. So we don't want um, the student to be following another curriculum 
and relearn different topics. We want to we want to focus on what the student already knows and what we can help them with further. So classes would be one hour. Classes are one hour um, a week for a maximum of ten weeks. And uh, in terms of volunteer hours, which would be incentive for someone to participate in our program, a tutor gets one hour per class. Uh, so let's say a student, uh, tutor has four students and they have one group class. As mentioned before, they can conduct either group or one-on-one. -on -one. If they have a group class, that would mean they have one hour earned per week. However, let's say they have four one-on-one -on -one classes with all, with all their students, they'll earn four hours per week. And this would be the same with three students, two, and, and even one. So, um, so the tutor can see if they have time to conduct more classes so that uh, they can also earn more hours. Quickly moving on to hours verification, because this is uh, definitely an obstacle that we would run in with. Uh, some tutors might say that we, they conducted the class, but maybe they didn't. So a tutor would have to take a screenshot at the end of the meeting to prove that they had the class. The volunteer outreach director would check with the schedule if this, you know, this uh, screenshot time matches their class time. And if, that, if that's all the case, then the hour is counted and we're all good. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this was an initiative that I thought about and started around five weeks back, just around the time of our last uh, youth leadership program uh, meeting. And uh, we've actually expanded to students across four states. So from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and California, and Michigan, uh, in the past four weeks, uh, we've had uh, 38 volunteering tutors uh, sign up, 159 registered tutees who have been matched with these tutors. And for that, uh, amongst the different sessions we've completed till now, we've had 135 total sessions completed. So you can see a rapid growth because a lot of students are, are definitely facing this, this issue and, uh, and STEM Ninjas is, is, striving to, is striving to provide a solution. <clears throat> so now uh, the future. Uh, so first we can provide maybe more selective programs for middle or high school students where we have you know, a guest speaker series uh, to talk about advanced topics and exclusive counseling advice for maybe participation in clubs and how they can how can they how they can advance their careers in STEM. This would also be uh, targeted towards more uh, low income communities and minorities because there aren't a lot of programs right now which which help them advance their STEM knowledge. So this would also entail more workshops, which would be during the summer to spread STEM knowledge and they'd be on a variety of different uh, platforms. Competitions like uh, you know a robotics competition, if you've heard of VEX or FIRST Robotics, something like that, uh, an engineering idea competition, math, uh, math competition, and possibly even a science fair. Uh, lastly, just a couple more, uh, hackathons, which would be for once again middle and high school students because they're more proficient at programming and coding. And uh, this week aimed towards social causes, uh, such as right now we have the Black Lives Matter um, movement that which is really active. So how can we how can we solve certain issues um, which the which the movement is addressing? So this would be for social causes. Um, so sponsorships to fund for prizes, other operational costs. We would contact local businesses in order to get the funds necessary. And lastly, expand, expanding our volunteer base. This would have a, a more um, an intricate process to become a volunteer because. Um, we want to have a written application and, and then an interview to make sure that the volunteer is the best that we can find and they will definitely help the student. So uh, we'll, we'll try to recruit from top schools and uh, top high schools in the state and possibly even the nation, uh, contacting the school districts themselves and opening chapters across the nation. One last thing for incentive for a volunteer to participate in STEM Ninjas over any other program would be a providing um, the opportunity for them to earn the Presidential Service Award, which, um, which is a prestigious award for, I think, both high schoolers, uh, I mean, below high schoolers as well, so middle school students as well, and also um, uh, people who, who are uh, a bit older. So uh, you, if, you, uh, if you earn hours for uh, STEM Ninjas, you would, you would possibly get the award. That is, we're coming towards the end. So if you wanna learn more, about the, about the program and, and our progress till now, you can actually visit our website or you can contact us. You can contact me um, using uh, the phone number, uh, email, or even, um, you know, using, uh, you can follow our Instagram. Uh, I'll just stay on that for just like five seconds to, so that you can, if you wanna copy anything down, you can. All right. Um, and just 
thank you. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm open them now, and these are my works I did. Thank you, Shivam. Does anyone have any questions for Shivam? Okay. So we've come to the end of all of the student presentations. Thank you so much for um, being with us. I just want to close out the session um, hearing from some of our leaders in the foundation and uh, people who have supported us for the last six months as we've done um, this pilot program. So uh, I first want to ask Dr. Geetha Guy, who I think is having some technical difficulties. She did send me something by text to read if she was unable to be back on. Um, Dr. Guy, are you with us? Okay, so I'm just going to read what she sent to me. Um, she said, I'm very impressed by the students' ability to understand human behavior and ask very probing questions, a skill that they had and further increased um, by this program. So she thanks you and uh, was honored to spend time with you. Dr. Guy actually came to one of our sessions a few months ago and the students had a chance to um, chat with her and um, learn from her and she from them. Uh, I am next going to turn it over to Dr. Mina Murthy, who um, is a senior advisor and, you know, chief support for everything that the SCAN Foundation does, a personal mentor of mine, um, and she has brought a very special guest with her today, so we appreciate that as well. Dr. Murthy, if you can, great, turn on your camera, um, we'll uh, speak with you and your friend, and then uh, close with Dr. Marotha, if he's still on. Thank you so much. Wow, I was blown away by the presentations. <laughs> um, on behalf of me, St. Peter's and SKN leaders, I want to greet all the students and our guests. This is a very special day of youth leader presentations. Uh, in my all years at SKN, uh, that's more than a decade, I would say, we have had many ideas, many initiatives, um, many programs. Uh, it's my opinion, the youth leadership uh, program has been the most exciting initiative, at least as far as I'm concerned. And today's presentations were more than impressive to me. Very difficult issues with deep rooted bias and behaviors, disparities and its corrosive effects on our society, they were all dealt with such young minds. What mattered to me most was not only uniformly problems were laid out really well, but evidence-based solutions were discussed with priorities and action plans. And as many of you who know me, I'm all for action plans. And I saw that in each and every student presentation, understanding not only our rights, but to take our responsibilities seriously and live with actions that lead to progress is the hallmark of leadership. And I saw this in all of the student leaders presentation. Um, so I, I thank the students who did all this work. I especially want to thank Anna, Dr. Anna Kuriakis, for bringing this wonderful program into reality. She is a tough taskmaster and a great mentor. Um, she is respected uniformly amongst her peers and seniors, and my hat's off to her today for bringing this program. I invited a special guest that I respect a lot, Dr. Dula Pacquio, um, who has served as Dean of Nursing School. More importantly, she has promoted cultural competency and leadership around our world. So uh, if Dr. Pacquio is still on, I can't see her, uh, uh, please say a few words. Do you see her? Yes. She's with us. I just want to make sure she's unmuted. Can you unmute Dr. Pacquio? Okay. 
Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I hesitated to make my comments individually, but I was truly impressed by how students dealt with hot topics, topics that are really meant for everyday life and the quality of the proposal. And some of you, Shivam, I'm very impressed. I think you could go for the CNN award. Um, but what I would like maybe to suggest that I really would like to show that the South Asian community is a role model for student development. So that your proposals, I think, if we can show, for example, how the South Asian vendors would decrease the use of plastic. We could be a role model for the state or the community. Uh, Sriya, your presentation on racism, I thought was very bold, insightful. Um, I do like the idea that although we pick and choose the matters that we advocate for, you are so right that this is one issue that we should be together with others. I'd like to see the South Asian community and Asians in particular to join that. There are, however, certain advocacy issues where we differ. For example, we've seen how the Asian students have been minimized because of a favored uh, admission to certain schools for certain groups of people, but wherever there is an issue that we could benefit from I so much like the idea that we focus on racism early at home, because that is where those attitudes are formed. Um, and I like the idea of, I, I did write a few things here. Language, you pick something that is so important to your community, and you could very well be a role model to do not wait for federal funding, it may come later, but maybe show them that you can create translation or translated booklet that would be helpful for the Department of Health and for practitioners in healthcare and others, such as voter registration. It could be adopted if that can be uh, focused on. And the idea of mental health, I really like how you focus on issues, showing your insights about your own culture and how we fit or how you fit within this, uh, the context of the US politics as well as healthcare and other issues. Thank you for inviting me. This has been a lovely day. I will write my comments to each of the students. I will email them to Dr. Murphy. Thank, Thank you, so you Dr. Pacquiao. Thank you. Um, so this was a, a, a wonderful experience for me. I was able to kind of get a, a, a great glimpse into the students' pro um, thought processes and what they've been thinking about and what's on their hearts. Uh, this was an entirely independently done project. And so I'm grateful and appreciative. And um, I, it just reminds me that really all these initiatives have to start at this age and with uh, our youth in order for them to be sustainable and to for our community to, to rise up as a whole. I want to close this meeting um, with our um, fearless leader, Dr. Naveen Marotra, who is the, um, the founder and executive director of the SKN Foundation, uh, the man who kind of began this entire project many, many years ago and has um, been a support to the execution of it. So after Dr. Marother's comments, we will uh, conclude the meeting. So thank you all for, for joining us. Dr. Marother, if you're able to speak. I see his name, but I'm not sure if he's busy. Dr. Marother, are you with us?
Okay, that's a shame. I thought maybe he was available. I know he had to go in and out this morning. He had a couple of things going on. So um, we appreciate, oh, I saw, I see him unmuted. Go ahead, Dr. Moser. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hold on one Thank second. Thank you for being with us. Give me one second. Sure. There you go, we see. Okay, hi. Uh, sorry, I'm in clinic and hospital and running between patients. So I've been trying to listen into uh, the presentations. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody else who's been part of this group. Uh, it, as Dr. Murthy said, it, it is a dream that has come true for us to actually have our first cohort of wonderful youth leaders and the presentations that they did uh, were uh, amazing. I think that the amount of thought that went into it, I didn't expect. Um, and I'm really thankful to all of you guys for thinking about our community. And I hope that you will continue on this path to go ahead and develop some of these, because I think what you are doing now as a youth is what is expected of you as leaders when you get into college and, and have larger roles in life and leading a pack of people around you, because I think you have those skills, which can then create a movement. As you've seen you know, with uh, Black Lives Matter and a bunch of other movements that have happened in society over time, you will be the leaders that will make these uh, uh, movements happen for our community. And as Shreya had said, you know, we're considered the model minority, and I think a bunch of other people have brought up issues where we are considered to be, quote unquote, you know, just perfect, but no society, no community is perfect, right? There are issues and there are teachings that have to be done for everyone. So I think the skills that have been uh, started to be taught to you through Dr. Kariakis, um, thanks uh, Anna for doing what you've done. And for all of the skills that you guys have learned, take them the next step forward and we will be there to support you anything that you think that you can go ahead and make it a movement, we would love it because I think that is what the program is about. And um, congratulations. Uh, I wish we could have done this in person and I wish, um, you know, but I, I look forward to it and hope that you become mentors as time goes on. And the newer people that will come on in the next cohort, uh, you know, we can have you guys come on in as guest speakers here and there and provide what you have learned. So you have done a fabulous job, even though it was virtual. And thank you so much, uh, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Pacquio, for uh, joining in uh, on this group. And I think I saw Julie Feibush's name as well. Uh, everybody else who uh, joined in from SKN, thank you for taking the time, um, Sabuha, and uh, I think a bunch of people that I saw for making this happen. And congratulations again. Thank you all. We, this has been recorded, so if it, um, you'd like for us to share it, please just reach out. The link should be available within a day or two, and I'll make sure to send it out to all the SKN leadership. Uh, if nobody has anything else, we are going to conclude for the day. Uh, it is, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Enjoy the beautiful weekend, the weather. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you for being with us today. Bye. Thank you.